be boring, but his guests aren't. It's Al's Boring Podcast. Oh, hi there. Al Dukes here, and my guest today on the podcast from Fox Sports is Kevin Burkhardt. Hi there, Kevin. Well, hello, Al. It's good to be talking to you. You too. Now, you're living in uh, California these days. You were a longtime Jersey guy. I, I am a uh, long time, first time. I don't know if that applies. Yeah, definitely. Along there, but uh, but yeah, yeah, I've been out in, in LA for a year and a half now, so it's been uh, it's been quite the life change. But um, I love it. It's been great. I mean, uh, it's it's a totally different deal, obviously, than what I'm used to. I, mean, I lived in Jersey my whole life, so <clears throat> you know, I lived in Jersey, worked in New York for a lot of it, and um, and then you come out here and. Um, Everything is different, basically, but uh, I've loved it. I mean, I'm, I've always been kind of a beach guy, so now it's, uh, for the most part, you get that weather 12, to 12 months out of the year. So it's it's been really cool. Yeah, when you move from the East Coast to any other place where it's warm, like I lived in Florida for a while, I think, like, why doesn't everyone just live in California, Florida, and Arizona? Yeah, I think that's a fair point. I mean, me personally, I don't know that I'd want to get uh, bitten by a scorpion in the middle of the night. So Arizona may be that's out for me. Um, but I agree with you on the weather. And now being here, it's like, what was I? What was I doing? Like not moving here early. <laughs> well, the problem is a, a lot of times our families keep us like in in certain geographical locations. Well, yeah, and obviously that's hard. You know, I mean, uh, all of uh, all of my family's home and. Yeah, you know, my wife's family's home and all, you know, so many of our friends are back there. So that's hard. So try and get back when I can, um, because you can't replace that. There's no doubt about it. But I mean, there is something refreshing about, you know, getting outside today and it's sunny and 65 degrees out. It's it's not the worst thing in the world. I can tell you that. Yeah, it's freezing here. So you grew up, were you, when you were a kid, did you grow up in Jersey? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I grew up in a town called Bloomfield. It's in uh, northern New Jersey. It's about, uh, 15, 20 minutes is outside of New York. Uh, and I lived there through college. And then uh, I guess the last 15 years or so, um, I had lived in Point Pleasant, New Jersey, down the shore. And when you were a kid, did you want to be a broadcasting kid? Did you like radio, TV, or just sports in general? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted, I definitely wanted to be a broadcaster, probably because I wasn't any good at playing anything. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, you know, we played sports all the time at, with my friends and at the park, and we played basketball for hours. And, uh, but I was never any good. You know, I, I just loved playing. And so, um, you know, I, I always watched as a kid. I grew up in a pretty big sports house. You know, uh, my parents loved sports. They loved football and baseball especially. So, you know, every Sunday was kind of, eh, you know, it was kind of a holy day, literally. You know, I mean, you know, my mom would uh, take us to church, and then we'd, we'd stop at the deli to get the cold cuts, and then we'd come home and just sit in front of the TV for eight hours and watch football together. So, I mean, you know, it's pretty hard not to get into football and when you come up with that, and I loved it. And, you know, baseball is the same thing. And I, uh, you know, uh, we didn't have cable when I was a kid. My family didn't have, have the money for, for cable. So I would watch, you know, the Mets when they were on, I think at that time it was Channel 9 on, yes. on, on Sundays. and and really, other than that, it was having the, the radio in the backyard while we were, you know, outside playing whipple ball or whatever. So um, it, it just kind of started at a young age that I always loved sports. I always loved medium. And, um, you know, as soon as I got to, I guess, high school is when when things really started, because <clears throat> there were a couple things. I mean, we had we had literally one camera in the communications department. So a buddy of mine and I would take the camera to the high school football games and we would broadcast them and they would believe it or not run it on the local access channel, which was, uh, awesome. You know, at that time we thought we were stars, you know? Right. Um, and then you combine that with the fact that, you know, I was also a nerd. So go home after school and, and, you know, my friend Dan would come over and my brother Brian and we'd be, uh, we'd put on, you remember, um, you remember the game Baseball Stars and Tecmo Bowl on Nintendo, Al? Here's oh, yeah, those. definitely. All right. Well, we would put those on, and we would um, – I had a dual tape recorder back in the day, so um, which were pretty hot. So we would put those on, and we would announce the game uh, together, and then we would do a post-game show after the game, So what we, which was kind of inspired by listening to the Mets. So, you know, we'd announce the game, and then we'd go back and say, okay, in the first inning – blah, 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 did this. And because I had the dual tape deck, 
on the first tape, I would play the clip and then hit record. <laughs> uh, and, and then, you know, the clip went on to the post game tape. So um, I got, I wish I, I don't even know if I still have them. I had a flood in one of my old houses and I may have lost it all, unfortunately, but I mean, I had these awesome tapes of me sounding like a high pitched, you know, sophomore in high school uh, announcing Nintendo games. And honestly, that's what really gave me the bug that I wanted to do it. And did you know that that was a major in college that you could go for communications and broadcasting? And if so, what, what were the steps you took after high school to do that? Yeah, I did. I, I, um, you know, I definitely did. And I, I knew I definitely wanted to go for that. Well, you know, I, I, in high school, I was always a smart kid, but I was really lazy. And, um, you know, I, I just did enough to get by, to be completely honest. And, and so I never really took it seriously until I got done with high school. And, and you know, or as I was getting done, and I was looking around where to go. And I was, oh, man, I, I don't have, I don't know where I can go. <laughs> so I, so I uh, you know, I applied to, and, and at that time, I just wasn't sure I wanted to leave home. Um so I applied to all the state schools in Jersey, you know, uh, William Patterson, Montclair State, Kane, and those schools. And, um, you know, I, I figured I would start there. And I kind of liked William Patterson because they had a good uh, communications uh, rep. And I, and I know they had, uh, you know, a good school there. And I figured, hey, I could go there and get my start. And then, you know, uh, you know, my dad and mom were on my case and say, hey, you know, it's, be, it's time to turn it around now. Otherwise, you know. <laughs> they were on me pretty good to actually be a real student and get my life together. And I took it seriously from that on in. So I, I, I said, all right, I got into William Patterson. I they had a good program. Let me go there. And then, you know, if I, um, you know, if I do well in a year that I could, I could transfer and go somewhere else. And that ended up being really great and lucky for me because I went there and, you know, they had an amazing program. They had an unbelievable communications program and one where as a freshman, I was able to jump in and dive in and, and do games and work on the TV crew and, and learn what it is to put a broadcast on the air. So, you know, some of these schools that are great but are bigger, you don't get to do that until you're, you know, maybe junior year. So so all of a sudden I just landed at this place uh, kind of by circumstance of, you know, some of it grades and some of it not wanting to leave and some of it the school's reputation that I liked. And, and I really liked it, and I found a home there, and um, it, it became a huge part of uh, my development. Uh, had that school previously had anybody of note working in broadcasting where when you were there you were like, oh, like they had pictures of this person on the wall, or you thought, I can aspire to be this uh, guy because he went to William Patterson as well? Or are you the first guy to come out of there that's uh, got a national presence? Yeah, I, I, broadcasting wise, I, yeah. you know, I don't want I don't want to slight anybody out. I don't remember that though. Uh, you know, and and they've had some some big people come out of that that now university. So, um, but I don't. I'll tell you this: there wasn't like it wasn't like I went on a tour or went online and be like, ooh, you know, uh, you know, so and so went here. Gary Cullen went here. I'm it wasn't here. Syracuse. And no, no, <laughs> no, it was not. They did not have plaques on the wall when you <laughs> drove up. You know, the biggest thing is you had to have. They had a nice communications building, but if you didn't have your parking pass, you were getting a ticket, and that's all that mattered. So, um, no, I, I just – it just fit at the time, and I truthfully had no idea that I would finish my college career there, but it turned out that I I wouldn't go anywhere else, you know, and I, in a way, I kind of I kind of have always felt like I've been an underdog, and – and I think that had something to do with it. And, and I kind of carry that as a proud badge that I went there. You know, it's certainly no disrespect to anybody who went to some of these great big schools that have enormous uh, storied programs, you know, the Syracuses and Missouris or, or wherever else, Northwestern, you know. But um, it, I, I think it's I, I like the fact that I did go there and I've had uh, some success and I could kind of put that badge on my shoulder to say, hey, you know, and what I – when kids ask me about it, I say, "Hey, you don't have to go to those schools. You know, you, you can you can make your own path somewhere else." And and I, I think that's kind of important. If I go to William Patterson now as a student, would, would I know that Kevin Burkhart went there? If I'm studying communications, like do they do they acknowledge that? Hey, this guy came through here. Oh, they absolutely acknowledge it. Nice. I I, I, now, granted, I don't think there's posters hanging in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> if, that's, if that's what you're asking, yeah, that's kind of what I'm asking. I, I don't know about that, but to my knowledge, there isn't the Kevin Burkhart the wing of the communications building. Not yet. Not that big. Yeah, exactly. But 
Um, you know what? They, they've been great to me. And I, I haven't been back much at all. I mean, partly now because I don't live, I live across the country. I was fortunate enough to give the uh, graduation speech a couple of years ago. And that was incredible. The fact that, the fact that they would think of me, you know, of all these people that could do a, you know, of me to go and do that. It was unbelievable. And it was so gratifying to do it. And, and the feedback I got from some of the kids was just, it was amazing. So I don't know if you walked in, if you would have any idea, but I could tell you that the people there treated me great. They still talk about me going there. And, and, you know, I always tell them, you know, if kids need to talk, I'm around to talk. You know, I know how that was. I had people do that for me. So that's the best I could hope for. And when you are going there as a student, are your parents into you having that as a major or were they just kind of happy that, hey, at least he's going to college and it's, he's successful at it because it's something he wants to do. Were they? Did they think, like, that doesn't have a great future? They were just totally supportive of me. You know, I, I don't. I never really asked them what they thought. I mean, I, I'm sure they – I'm sure deep down in their, in their heart, they're like, boy, it would be great if he was going to be an accountant or a lawyer or something. Yeah. But, um, you know, but they – they never were not supportive of, of me. They never once said, hey, you know, why don't you go for something else? They were always encouraging and, you know, trying to watch or listen what I did. And, and um, you know, they wanted me to do it. I, I, don't, I really don't know deep down what they really thought, if I had a shot uh, or if it was smart or whatever. But they were 100 percent supportive. And as you know, something like that is not the easiest thing to get support on because, it, uh, you know, percentage wise, it usually doesn't make sense for long term. And then as you're getting to your senior year and you're graduating from William Patterson, what is your game plan for like, okay, now I need to get a job. So what do you start doing to to sort of look for work with zero experience other than college radio? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I, I, I got a little lucky. I got um, my, my senior year um, and I, I stayed an extra half semester. I was there for four and a half years mainly because I never wanted to take summer courses. I wanted to enjoy the summer, uh, and and so I never did. So I had a couple courses to finish up, so I stayed for the extra half year. And an internship that I got for the final few months was at this radio station, WGHC, in uh, Pompton Lakes, New Jersey, just down the road from William Patterson. It was a 1,000-watt radio station that um, – it was a daytime station. So you could hear it, you know, and went to, I don't know, 20 towns, you know, maybe, and it shut off at night. No, no kidding. So, like, when the <laughs> sun went down, the station turned off. Now, you know what that is because you work in radio. Most people are like, come on, that can't be real. Oh, it was real, you know? So, like, right. you know, it, so in December at 430, the sun goes down. I'm like, all right, guys, see you tomorrow. <laughs> like, we're done. <laughs> turn you the know? big switch off and everyone goes home. That it Literally, turn the switch off and everybody goes home. That's exactly what happened. It was the most bizarre thing in the world. So, anyway, I interned there. And, um, you know, it was great because, you know, it's, I had done TV all throughout college. I really didn't touch on radio much. You know, I took classes and I learned and I was around the station a little bit, but, um, really my, I did a lot of TV and a lot of production. So, so I had this internship and I really just kind of did everything there. I mean, I did some on air stuff. I did promotions. I did a little bit of sales. I did like whatever needed to be done. So, you know, as the internship's come and close and the, and the guy who owned the station, um, this guy, John Silliman, who was like a millionaire, was a super sweet man who just loved local radio. And, and really, this was a, a way to, you know, kind of um, serve the local listeners. He was a huge local radio radio guy growing up. And so anyway, so he he's like, hey, you know, I really like your work ethic and, um, you know, do you want to stay on? I know, you know, you're a sports guy, but, you know, maybe we could have you on and do, you could do like the high school football on the weekends and you could do this and you could do like, some, we don't really have anybody to do like promotions and publicity or, you know, marketing, anything like that. Maybe, you know, we could kind of put this thing together and you could just do all these things for us. So, I mean, how do you say no to that? Right. I had no job. I had no idea where I was going. I was like, yeah, of course. So basically um, that's what I did. I got hired and I kind of said, okay, um, I took my public relations courses and PR courses that I had from Dr. Lesher at William Patterson, and I put together a game plan of how to get the station noticed a little bit and, and how to, you know, kind of, quote, run, uh, you know, a marketing campaign uh, as much as you can do for a thousand watt station that didn't have much money. Um, you know, and then I, I put together a plan for how to do high school sports, and he basically let me do all of it. I mean, so it was 
you know, I, I, it was trial by fire. It was pretty amazing. And what I did um, is, you know, I had a couple people that I talked to. We had this engineer who um, had been in radio forever, was used to be a star disc jockey. His name is Tom Niven. And uh, since he's passed away, unfortunately, but he's one of my, you know, one of my role models growing up. And he was not a sports guy at all, but he would tell me like things that were important to radio and he would help me with technical things, things that I just had no concept of. Um, and he was just a huge supporter of mine in my career. And he wasn't a, a sports guy, but you know, he would listen and be like, Hey, um, now I didn't know what you were talking about, but this I liked and this I didn't like. And it is weird because you say, well, how can he help you if he doesn't know sports? But he did because you know, he, he, even though he came up in the old school and he was, you know, a big time DJ when, you know, when the Beatles were big and all this stuff, this guy knew what he was talking about. And so I had this support, but really no structure for what I was doing. And yet I had this owner who was like, yeah, go ahead, build it and like, see what you can do. And so what I did is I interviewed the people to find a color analyst. I hired my brother to be a stats guy. I, um, I then, you know, made a proposal to build this like, so-called high school sports department because that's what uh, the owner wanted. He wanted local. So um, so we kind of devised ways to kind of have a high school sports coverage like the local newspapers did, you know. Um, and then the last thing I did is for Saturday, I said, how could we – they had been doing high school football games on the radio for years. So I said, okay, how can we make this better? And what I did is um, – and sorry, I'm kind of long-winded here, but I, I kind of like this story um, – so I, I ended up going off the the WFAN show, the NFL Now. You know, I um, I used to listen to it all the time. I think Eddie was uh, Eddie C was doing it the whole time. You know, where you you're Sunday and you're getting the calls from all the stringers of the games. You know, mm-hmm. um, and so I loved that show. So I'm like, huh, I wonder if we can incorporate this into our games on Saturday. So what I did is I ended up hiring um, I don't know four people. Just, you know, getting paid a couple bucks an hour to come in on Saturday. Um, and basically what we did, because remember at the time now, uh, um, cell phones were, I don't even know if cell phones, I think they, they had just come out, but they weren't really nearly obviously what they were now. So what we ended up doing is hired them all, and I brokered this deal with a local store to get pagers for all of us, right? And... Um, so we had this system, this pager system, where I would have a, a, a pager uh, on the game I was doing. And, like, say I would get a beep that was all ones. Well, that was a code for, okay, I have an update for, you know, the butler pomp the life game. So, you know, we'd have an out-of-bounds play in our game. I'd say, hey, for an update on the butler game, let's go to David Brooks. And then the person in the studio would play David's 20-second sounder on the game update. So, essentially... It was the NFL now for high school football. I don't know that many people listened to it, but I thought at the time it was pretty damn cool. <laughs> it, was, it was innovative at the time. It was innovative, I thought. And um, after a while, we did get traction, and people loved it. And, and, and um, so I was pretty proud of what we went on to do there. I worked there for eight years, and it was, it was awesome. I mean, it, it built me. You know, I mean, obviously at times I'm like, oh, my gosh, like I want to get out of here. I want to get – I want to get better opportunities, and, and I kind of felt like I was good enough. But, you know, you know how it is. People don't respond to you. They don't want to hear from you. And, and it's hard to get somebody to listen to your tape and give you a chance. But, you know, I was pretty proud of what we did there. And it was great for me because it was trial by fire. I learned just by doing. You know, I made mistakes, and I learned from it, and I got better from it. So, you know, I, I think in some ways, you know, it, it took me a while to get to get breaks and to get people to believe in me and, and trust me. But at the same time, I think the person that I was when I got out of school and when I started the station, I just wasn't that great of a broadcaster. I mean, I think I had the idea of how to do it well. And I did some things well, but I just think I got so much better just from being there. Welcome to Play It, a new podcast network featuring radio and TV personalities talking business, sports, tech, entertainment, and more. Play it at play.it. It's Al's Boring Podcast with Al Dukes. And when you're working there for those eight years, does working at a place like WFAN seem like uh, imp- an impossibility? Like, do you think, how do, how do you even get an opportunity to do something like that? It's 
seem pretty impossible because, you know, you, you just, you know, I would send stuff out all the time. I mean, you know, I was on, you know, honestly today it's so different, but you know, at that time I was on, you know, radio and records and all these websites and trade magazines and just trying to get somebody to listen to my tape, you know, and you're redoing your resume constantly and you're trying to get any little thing you can just to get ahead. Um, and yeah, it seemed like it was a million miles away. It really did. It just seemed like, you know, just to get a call back, just to get an audition, just to get something was so hard when deep down in your heart, you know, I, I think I was pretty fair with myself. I think I, I think I thought I was decent, you know, and, and if I didn't, I would have done something else. So I did it cause I loved it, but I also thought I could do it. But, you know, you had some moments, like I remember, you know, we ended up putting together this talk show, um, this, this high school talk show. And we occasionally had other guests and, and Bob Papa was really great to me. You know, like he, he's one of the guys that I just kind of randomly called. I actually think I called the, um, the Nets at the time. And I just said, Hey, this is my name. I was like, can I get Bob Papa's number? I'm doing a show. And they gave it to me. And <laughs> I called Bob, I called Bob and, and he was awesome. He came out a couple of times and he was very nice. And that was kind of encouraging to me. So I was like, okay, like if this guy's like willing to take home this, come out with me, maybe I don't suck, you know? And, and so just like little things like that, little victories, you know, um, that, that kind of keep you going. And then how did you eventually get a job at WFAN? Well, I got to fast forward a number of years. Um, I mean, basically, let's see. So it went from, I was doing a bunch of other stuff. Uh, I was doing minor league baseball while I was still working at WDHT. I was doing, you know, public address jobs here and there. I did work for Time Water Cable. I had a bunch of little jobs. And and how did those little jobs pay the bills? Because I'm sure they paid nothing back then. They don't pay anything now. So I wonder how you were able to do that for that many years out of college. Well, um, I, I, I was pretty frugal and, you know, believe it or not, the radio station was okay. It was, it, it was, I mean, it wasn't good, but it was, it was okay. It wasn't totally, you know, piss poor, um, basically because the owner of the place was generous <laughs> mm-hmm. and, um, but you know, some of the other jobs, I mean, you know, the minor league baseball, you didn't make much money. And then I was doing, I was working for, so get this, you'll appreciate this. So this was working for Time Warner Cable. Um, and I was, I was like a, they had a show and it only served like upper Bergen County at the time, but they had a, you know, like a newscast, a local newscast and a sports show. And they had a high school sports recap show that would air, I think on Sunday night. So they would send guys out to Friday games and then you would put together a package, um, like a four and a half, five minute package. And for those of you not in TV, four and a half, five minute package for television is insane. I mean, first of all, it's so long to watch. Second of all, it takes usually the, the rule was always, if you put together a minute, a piece, it takes an hour to put together. So anyway, I'd go to this high school football game on Friday, do my due diligence, do interviews after the game. And then come back and try and sculpt the story that included highlights and sound bites that was, you know, between four and five minutes long. Guess how much I got paid for the entire thing of doing all of that? <laughs> Could be nothing, right? $25. Nice. But what are you going to do, Al? It's what I wanted to do, right? It was, it was right. my first, like, TV job out of college. So uh, $25, I, you know, I worked like 15 hours for a $25 <laughs> paycheck. It was unbelievable. But, you know, that's what, that's the kind of stuff you had to do. So, um I guess fast forwarded to FAN, you know, I finally just got sick of it all and I just quit. Um, and I sold cars for a year, which I think, you know, that story has been out there. But, you know, it, it was just kind of one of those, you know, like I'm so annoyed that I can't get a break. I know I'm good enough, but it's just I can't. I need to make some money. That's exactly what happened. And so, you know, I went and did that, but it, it was really great in a lot of ways. A, I learned some things about myself. Um, B, I had some great people there who were who are still great friends. Um, and, you know, I, I just learned not to give up on myself. I was there and it kind of made me hungry again. Like, okay, I'm not giving up on this. Like I'm, I'm going to give it another run. And so while this was going on, I had gotten in and done uh, <clears throat> some CBS stuff. I was doing part time at WCBS, uh, you know, occasional fill in shifts, things like that. And then, um, and then a full-time CBS job opened up, for the afternoon update anchor. And so I left and took that. That was like really, that was really a, the first big break to get that. And then, um, you know, FAN was always my dream and to work there. And then Eric Spitz, who, you know, uh, one of the guys uh, of the many who I wouldn't be here today without him, he came over and worked 
and, and kind of directed Shadow and CBS Sports. So he became my boss and became my friend. And, um, you know, at one point I just kind of said, hey, don't you think I'm good enough to at least come in and audition for WFAN? And he said, yeah, come in. <laughs> and uh, so I did, and I went in and, and, you know, I did like an update with John Minko, and he gave me all this stuff, and, and Eric really um, – took care of me. You know, he, he basically crafted a role and he said, Hey, you know, you come over here. I, and, you know, I think at the time I actually, I didn't make any more money. Maybe took even a little pay cut, but he kind of crafted this role for me where I would be a reporter, update guy, part-time host. Basically whenever they needed to plug spots, um, I, I would be the guy and, to do it and, and to kind of craft this role because he thought I was good and liked me. And, so they did that, and I kind of became the Jets reporter, and I covered Rangers and Knicks, and I did updates, and I hosted shows at 2 in the morning on Saturday morning. You know, I, I did everything, but, you know, I finally got there, and it was just such a – it was such a victorious moment to feel like I, I I was able to do it, you know? Uh, getting in that place that I always listened to and always dreamed of being, it was, it was really – a pretty cool moment for me. And then how long were you at WFA and doing those different jobs before the SNY Mets job came along? And how did that come along? I think I was there for, for almost three years. I'm bad. I'm so bad with, with, with years and stuff. I really should go back and retrace my whole resume, but I haven't done one in 15 years, but I think I was there for about three years now. And um, what happened is one of the years that I was covering the jets when SNY was on the air, you know, SNY had all those jet shows. So there was a day where there's a couple of days where they needed some stuff and they're like, Hey, you know, can you help us out? You know, at camp and also you maybe come in and you could have, you could be a part of like the jets inside the jet show for this week or, or something, you know? So, um, at that time, I think I just came in as a contributor. I, I forget. It might've been Brian Custer hosting and Ray Lucas with them. I don't remember, but anyway, so I did some stuff at, at, you know, jets camp one of the days. And then, you know, during later in the week I went in and I was kind of a contributor on the show. Um, and then it kind of, it went well. So I got a couple more of those. And, and at the time my agent was trying to find me some TV stuff. Cause I really wanted to get into TV. Um, and as much as I loved the fan, I knew there really wasn't a future there for me because, you know, I, I think I was good at all the jobs I did there, but I wasn't, um, an emotional type talk show host. You know, I think I was a measured, I think I was a pretty good talk show host, but I, I wasn't as good as some of the other guys there. And I just, you know, I knew it was what it was, you know, it was great. I loved it there, but I knew I wanted to do TV and I knew there probably wasn't much room for going forward there because I mean, people don't ever leave that place. Right. So, um, so it really worked out great. It kind of got me in S and Y and I started doing a couple of other TV things. I did a couple of things like ESPN classic, just like appearances on like these talk shows and just to get my face out there and get me used to being on television. And so then when, uh, you know, after their first year with the Mets with SNY, Chris Cotter, who, you know, I always thought was great, um, but just didn't really want to do that. You know, he wanted to do other things. And so, you know, they're looking for something. And because I had worked there a little a little bit, they brought me in for an interview. And I think, you know, I, I think two things. I think, I think I did pretty well when I was on camera, so that helped. But I think you know, at the time, SNY had hired, when they started, a lot of people who weren't from here or – I say here, I'm in LA now, but you know what I mean, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Right. And um, and I think it was a huge benefit to me that I knew the area. I knew the team. You know, uh, I, I mean, I hosted talk radio and talked about the Mets for six hours straight in the middle of the night. So, you know, I knew the dynamic. Um, and I think that was a big help. No one ever told me that, but, you know, I, I don't think that hurt me for sure. So anyway, I went on an interview and I just, it was great to have the interview. I really didn't think for a second that I was going to get the job. I just was really, uh, but it was considerate that he had me in Kurt Gowdy and, and talked to me. And then, and then I got a call at Christmas time before end of 06 and like, Hey, uh, you know, you got the job. I'm like, what job? <laughs> <laughs> They're like the Met job. I interviewed for it once and, uh, and that was it. And it was a great interview, but I just forgot about it. And they like the Met job. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, honest to God, I, I had no idea. So it was like, holy cow, like, you know, and then it just kind of all hit me. Like, what does this mean? And what's this, you know, what's going to happen? And what is exactly the job? And, and, and yeah, it was kind of mind blowing and obviously life changing at the time. And was the same team in place with the uh, Gary Cohen, uh, Keith and Ron? 
Yeah, they were. They were there um, that first year. So I joined them in the second year of SNY. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it was cool in a lot of ways. I, I'm not a starstruck person at all. I'm really not. And there was there was one cool moment. Though. I mean, I've always I've met Gary once or twice in passing and he was nice. Um, but I mean, I respect him and always looked up to him because I thought he was great. You know, and I listened to him on the radio and I, I just thought he was amazing. And so I was really excited to work with him. Um, and, you know, Ron and Keith, I mean, you know, I grew up a Mets fan. So so we're at we're at dinner in spring training. It was just us and uh, our boss, Kurt Gowdy. And I'm sitting there and, you know, we're just having a good time. And really, the dinner is just essentially for me to get to know the guys more. You know, this is like before our first broadcast. And so I just text my dad. I'm like, dude. <laughs> sitting at dinner with Gary, Keith, and Ron. This is pretty nuts. And, he, you know, I mean, that was, like, just one of those moments where, like, okay, is this, is this real life type type thing, you know? Um, and then, you know, I'm lucky. It just worked out that they're, like, three of my greatest friends. And, you know, and as far as Gary goes, you know, I have to say this. I, I don't know many people or any people in, in our industry where you would go in as um, – a little bit younger of a guy who has play by play aspirations and get treated the way I did by Gary. Most people would shun them. Yeah. Be insecure he, about it. They'd be insecure. Not him. He, all he did was help me, help me get better. Um, we had, you know, we had the greatest, greatest relationship. I mean, you know, when he would, when I would fill in for him and do games, he would watch <laughs> And give me, I would ask him for critiques, and he'd give me good and things that maybe he thinks I could try to work on. I mean, that, I mean, who would do that? You know, who would who would? Do, I could tell you nobody, <laughs> because everybody's so protective in the industry and so insecure. Not him. So it, I, it was really lucky that situation to walk into everything, the job, the guys that I worked with, everything. It was awesome. And then did you, I always think it's a a tough thing to be the guy in the crowd at these baseball games and you're doing your, your shots from in the crowd and you, you don't have any notes or anything, right? There's nothing for you to look at other than to look towards where the camera is. Right. I had notes. Sal. I I always took notes um, for sure. But I, I, I had like a, you know, one of those reporter's pads that I was carried around. So I took plenty of notes. But I basically, um, when I took them, you know, I took them kind of in bullet points. And, you know, that's how I kind of tried to look and, and memorize them real quick before I went on the air. And I, and I had the pad there in my hand. So if I ever needed to look down, um, I could and it was there. But over time of doing it, I just got to the point where I didn't need it. Um, you know, I would look. You know, before I would go on with a story, I would read it through, and and it would usually stick. Um, But I had the pad there, and I I definitely had notes. You know, the the trickiest thing for me was I had no idea what I was doing when I started. And I had an unbelievable producer, Greg Picker, who was so good and so smart. And, you know, obviously I watch a million sports. I see all these sideline people and what they do. And I had an idea of how I wanted to do it, but in really what it comes down to, it was, you know, it was about what the producer wanted. And, you know, I'm coming off working at the fan where I'm talking to myself for five hours at a time on an overnight and talking 10 billion words a night. (laughs) And now all of a sudden I'm going to go here and I might be on for a total of three minutes, the entire game. And I go home and I'm like, wait, what, did I work? Like, what What happened? You know, because you go in and you're busy the whole time and you're doing stuff for the pregame and you're, you're getting nuggets and you're working on stories for that day and for the next day. And uh, and then you do your pregame stuff and then you jam dinner down your throat and then you go on and you're, you're in the game the whole time. Don't know when and if you're going to be used. It depends how the game goes. And then you do your postgame and you go home. But just the time on camera – the actual time, not the work done, but the time on camera compared to radio when you were on all the time. It was so weird to me, you know, and, and Greg just said when I started, he said, listen, and I'm glad he did because otherwise I, I probably would have butchered it. He said, I don't care how many times you're on. I don't care um, if you're on 10 times a game. I don't care if you're on no times a game, really. He's like, what I care about is when you're on. If you're on one time a game, that you bring something to the table that's good, that you bring something that 
um, that can make people think about it, that can add some information to Gary, Keith, and Ron, that could get them talking about a topic, something that you find interesting as a baseball fan, um, whatever it is, human interest story, baseball technical story. Well, you know, he's like, I don't care. I don't want you to think, going, hey, I've got to be on five times tonight. I want you to work on stories and get stuff, whether it's long or short, that's interesting. And that was so helpful because, you know, even though I would go in every day and I had a goal and I always wanted to come out with like three good nuggets if I could, you know, and some days I had five and some days I had nothing. It, 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 you know, it's hard, Al. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you how you do it when you're doing 162 games or however many you would do a year, and especially in those seasons when things were not going well for the Mets in the by the second half of the season. Like, how did you come up with things to do in those crowds when there wasn't a big crowd at the stadium, the fans weren't into it as much because it was like same old Mets? Like, how, how did you come up with stuff every day? Well, you know, as far as the crowd thing goes, I just started moving around because I was bored. To be, you know, and, and I, I, I wanted some action. So, like, sitting in the chair next to the dugout just didn't do it for me. So, I, I never got a direction to move around. I just started doing it. And and then they liked it. You know, my director liked it, Bill Webb, because it was, like, cool shots. And, you know, I would never put myself in a place of, like, you know, in the middle of, like, 20 drunk fans. But I would just <laughs> go to different parts and kind of showcase the park a little bit, especially yeah. on the road. I would just go to a what I thought was a cool shot and just change it up. You know, sometimes you walk around the park, you get a little flavor and you find something out, honestly. So, you know, I would just go early and, and just walk around uh, beginning of the game or sometimes I'd be like, Oh, cool. I want to do a hit from, from up there or, or, or whatever. So it just, it just turned out like it started as me just kind of being like wanting to change it up, change up the scenery. And then it became a thing, but it, I was never directed to do that. I think it came, you know later in the, in my years there we had some we had some things that were sold like at home, like on the Pepsi ports. Like I think we had a couple of them that were actually like, okay, you know, Pepsi paid for you to do a hit up here, so make sure one of your stories is from up at the Pepsi porch. But other than that, I never was told once where to go. Welcome to Play It, a new podcast network featuring radio and TV personalities talking business, sports, tech, entertainment, and more. Play it at play.it. It's Al's Boring Podcast with Al Dukes. And uh, Kim Jones had that experience where she was out in the crowd. I think it was in Minnesota when she was talking about the food at the park and she had a pork chop and a guy on camera a drunk fan ran up and uh, ate the pork chop right from her hand. Did, <laughs> oh, did, yeah. did, did you ever have a, a a strange situation like that that comes to mind right away when you think about strange things that has happened in the crowd while you've been out there? Um, you know, I, I think I was pretty lucky. Uh, I, I don't. I never had like an incident like that. You know, you had a couple people that try to uh, act like fools on camera and try to jump in your shot, and and you know. And, um, you know, if I sensed that before we went on, I always just said, guys, if you act like an idiot, they're going to cut the camera. If you just hang here and, like, give a little wave, you'll be on camera, and you can go pull it off the DVR and tell your friends you're on the <laughs> Met game. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if I, if I sensed that it was going to be, like, you know, it could be a little dicey, um, I just kind of gave them that message because that's what would happen. They would come to me, and my director is so quick. He would just bolt off the shot if he sensed something stupid. So I, I – I was just lucky. That thing that happened to Kim was ridiculous. And you did. Uh, that some... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry go ahead. No, no, no. I, I was done. What's up? What were you going to say? Um, and in how, how many years did you do that for when you were out in the crowd and that sort of thing for S and Y? I did that for eight, uh, eight years or seven. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I did it through 14, right? So. I uh, started 07, 08, 09, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, eight years. And did you like being on the road all of those, uh, that that part of the year? Did you get used to that, or do you never get used to that, especially when you have a family? You never get used to it. Um, I, I did like traveling, and I like being on the road, and I like going to different places and, you know, meeting new people and doing stuff with the different teams and the cities. I, getting a flavor of what baseball is like. I, I did like that part. Yeah. I think what it is though, Al, is, you know, no one ever wants to hear it because you have a dream job and it's amazing and people would kill for the job. And I get it. So no one wants to hear you complain, but the reality is, you know, just the physical toll it takes on your body 
and mental toll in terms of whatever it is, you know, family, friends, social life, anything. Um, when you're traveling in like in a month's time, when you work 29 of 30 days and you're in eight different cities, um, you know, and you get in at, 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 in, you know, at four in the morning. And, yeah, I get, you know, 90 percent of the time, 85 percent of the time I was on the charter with the team. But you're still getting in at four in the morning and I'm walking in my door at five thirty and then I gotta go to a game at City Field at night. It's still not easy to do. <laughs> you know? And and so I just think it's exhausting. And I, I I'll tell you one thing for me, I got a whole not that I didn't have respect before, I have a whole new respect for these players that play every day. Because I don't know how they do it. All, all I did was talk. You know, all I did was show up and and, and try and have a press polo shirt and talk. And and they got to go out there and 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 physically play every single day. I, I it gave me a whole new respect for how the hell they do that and take care of the bodies to survive that season because it is a long year. I'm telling you, you get to like you get to like the beginning of August and you're like, holy cow, there's like two full months left. <laughs> and you know, again, it's like the type of thing where people don't want to hear because it it's, how can you complain? It's not complaining. It's just reality. It's a physically taxing and mentally taxing job. You have to be a strong person to do that well every day. You just do. And w- did you become friendly with uh, players often, or was that kind of weird because you were covering them, or how did you handle that? You know, I, I, I became friendly with some of them, but I never went out with them. I, I just never did. That was my thing. I, I um, um, You know, I, I became friendly, obviously, in terms of, you know, having phone numbers and, and text messages are certainly when I needed something or, or had needed information. I was able to call and ask and, you know, uh, use them as a source or whatever it was. But I, I never, I just never really wanted to cross the line and like go out to dinners and maybe ask guys to go out for a drink. I don't know. I just, that was just me. Al. You know, I, you're with them all the time. Um, and, and I just didn't want to cross that line. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to be a, a homery guy. You know, I, I, I I wanted to be fair on the broadcast, and I felt like if I ever did that, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been as down the middle. Now, look, that's not to say that certain guys I really like, and that deep down I, I didn't root for, because I did. Uh, I think that's human nature. But I never wanted to just, you know, cross. It. To me, it was an imaginary line, and I know everybody has their different ways of doing it. So, was I friendly with guys? Absolutely. Um, did I ever get to that point where I was hanging out with them? By the time I'd ever hang out with them is if it would. You know, after a game, if like if we're all at a hotel bar, if they're there, and, and then we would talk. That's one thing, but I, I would never, um, I never really went out um, outside the ball yard with guys. And as you did that uh, job for a number of years, did it start to? Did you start to think, well, this this might be, um, uh, you know, I can't do this forever. So, what were you starting to think was your next step as you were doing this year after year? Well. I always wanted to do football. Um, it, you know, I, it, growing up in a football baseball house, the NFL really was my number one thing that I always loved. And, um, and you know, I, I, like I told you before, early in the podcast, you know, I grew up and my family was all Mets fans. And, and I grew up in the NFL was just this huge thing. And, and I always dreamed of being, you know, summer all in Madden, you know, I mean, it, Anytime they would start a broadcast on a Sunday, it would get me so fired up. You know, I could just hear Pat, you know, uh, welcome to Philadelphia. And it just, it just, wherever he was, it just, I loved it. So, you know, I, I, um, I, I had conversations with my agent and, and I said, uh, Hey, listen, you know, I really want to do football. I was like, I, I haven't, I don't have a tape for years. The last tape I had was the high school football games I did for that that radio station that I told you about WGHT. And I said, that doesn't even sound like me anymore. I said, you're just going to have to take my word that I truthfully think I'm pretty good at it. I was like, I wouldn't tell you that if I didn't think I was, I said, um, so can you find me a game? Did you think you, you, you were going to, you were going to be able to jump to doing play by play or, or because of what you were doing with the Mets, did you think you had a better shot getting in as a sideline guy? Well, listen, I, I wouldn't have turned down the sideline job. I thought I, I was getting pretty good at that job, um, but I wanted play-by-play. It's what I wanted to do. Um, and I've always taken pride in the fact that I think I'm pretty versatile. Um, and so I said to my agent, hey, find me a game. And this is where another FAN connection comes in, Michelle Salvatore, who um, 
you know, worked at the fan for years and, you know, was an assistant to Mark Chernoff and Eric Spitz back there. And, and, you know, I obviously knew her from there and we were friends and, um, she needed a game. It was New Year's Day. Uh, I forget what year this was, but it was New Year's Day, and one of her announcers had to bail for one of the bowl games her radio company was doing. And so, you know, I told my agent, I was like, I'll do it great. I don't care. I just want a tape. And so Michelle said, yeah, I'd love to have Kevin. And so I went, and I did uh, the Houston Bowl, the Texas Bowl. It was Navy and Missouri. And um, I did the game. It went well. And then um, – it worked out where, you know, S and Y let me do some games and um, Michelle hired me to do some more games. And, and all of a sudden I was doing football on the radio and, and that was huge. You know, it was huge for my confidence um, for her to give me a shot. Um, the line was great for me to get back doing it. after not doing football play by play for years. Um, but I knew as soon as I did it again, that's what I wanted more than anything, because it's, it's just, the adrenaline rush that I get from doing it, nothing compares. And then where were you able to go from that, doing that one game? What was your next step for football? She had some games with Compass Media that um, they, they had all these properties between college and NFL. So they had some NFL games that were available the next year. So I think I did, um, I want to say like four or five games with uh, Curtis Conway, the ex bear receiver. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I did that. And I think I did that similar situation for two years. And then after that, they signed a deal with the Dallas Cowboys to be like their national network carrier. And, um, you know, they weren't, they weren't going to use their local guys. So um, Michelle offered it to me um, to do it. And so that was enormous. So I did, you know, the Cowboys games for two years with Danny White on radio. And that is what got me noticed by Fox. Well, since they got me noticed, Fox, we had had a dialogue about different things for years, but they never heard me do football. And when I did that, um, they basically hired me to do football off of those radio tapes. I don't know anybody's ever done that or taken a leap of faith on someone that I could do football on television because the first Fox game I did on TV um, three years ago, Al, that was the first time I did a football television game since college. <laughs> right there on national Fox football. So now I didn't tell anybody that I, I figured I'm either going to, I'm either going to screw it up or roll and, and, and hopefully roll. And I had just great coaching, thank goodness, up to and through the game to get me through it. But once I did that first one, I was like, all right, I, I, I think I can do this. So, and was, um, was that yeah. first one with John Lynch? Yeah. John's been my partner the entire time. He is the man. And, and he was new at that as well. Right, he didn't do he didn't do that for very long. Uh, being a uh, color commentator for football, yeah, he had done it. He had done it, believe it or not, for a couple of years. But it, he, um, let's see, I think the first year he was doing it, he had a game or two, and then he had two just about full seasons. Um, he had a, he had a couple of years. He did one one year with Ron Pitts, another with Dick Stockton. So it, it, you know he hadn't been doing it forever. He had been doing it for a couple of years. He had he certainly had some experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, still in the grand scheme of things, a couple of years doing that, is, you're still kind of growing and learning. So it was kind of cool because here I am with, you know, this iconic player who I obviously grew up watching and, and he couldn't have been better to work with. And especially, you know, me first time and he was embracing, he wasn't anything like, who is this guy that they're throwing me with? He was awesome. And it was kind of neat because I think we felt like after the first couple of games or maybe even before that, it you know, we're, we're both the same age. And I, I think we kind of felt like, you know, it's pretty cool. You know, we, we like each other and it seems right. And, you know, maybe we can grow with this for a while, you know, and, and look, I'm not looking ahead, but I don't know. Sometimes how you just do stuff and you, it just kind of feels right. feels good, you know, and it, and it just did from the beginning. It just, I don't know. It just, I always felt like I was, I was in a good place when, when I started doing this. And do you feel like, do you have uh, more free time doing football versus baseball or, or are you very bu- as busy during the week when you do football games during the season? I mean, I'm home more doing football, but the prep work is unbelievable to do a football game. I mean, you know, I'm putting in tons of hours. I, I don't know how many hours it is at home, but probably, I don't know, 20, 25 hours. And um, and doing all the prep I have to do, and then we'll leave either Thursday night or early Friday morning to go to a city, and then we meet with that team, go to practice, and get all these notes, and then we have meetings, and then Saturday we do the visiting team, and 
and then Sunday you do the game, and then you fly home, and then all of a sudden Monday repeat the process. So, I mean, in the three and a half days that I'm home, it's nice that I'm I'm here and not, you know, gone every single day. But it's, it's um, you know, it's probably a little less work for sure because baseball you have a game every night. But it's still plenty of work. There's no doubt about it. Was it weird or an adjustment for your family to have you home more often than you were? they were used to having you home? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think both, you know, I mean, it, it was, it was strange. I mean, I was never here. You know, I was, I was never home. And even when I was, you know, I get a rare day off with the Mets. I was probably dead and just wanted to relax and sleep. And, and that really wasn't much fun for anybody. So, um, yeah, it's definitely been different and rare to be home and be able to do things, you know, I'm coaching my son's basketball team. You know, I would never have had the opportunity to do that before. So, like, those things are nice. And uh, earlier when you mentioned that you had quit the business to go sell cars, how were you at selling cars? Because I always think if I ever lost my job, I always think I think I could be pretty good at selling cars. Is it harder or easier than people think? Oh, it's hard. It is. (laughs) Yeah, it's hard. I mean, you, I was not the, I didn't sell the most units at our store, but I had actually, at the time, I had the best customer service rating, which is pretty cool. Nice. Um, I had a boss who was awesome. He was like totally supportive of my radio and TV hopes. And um, he's still a great friend. And I'm actually the spokesperson for the dealership now. Oh, um, Pine Belt Chevrolet, yes? Yes. Yeah, it's now Pine Belt Nissan. Oh, yeah, Pine Belt close, Nissan. Yeah. Uh, Pine Belt Nissan on Towns River and Keyport, Al. I mean, oh, I've got nice. a good tagline out there. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so it, but it's hard. You know why? Because you have to, there's two reasons. It's like running your own business, first of all, because you can't just rely on people just, just randomly walking onto the lot anymore. It doesn't happen as much. Um, it used to be in the day people walked on the lot and they didn't know anything and they wanted to buy a car. Well, now people come on the lot, they usually have done every bit of research possible. And so, you know, they're shopping around a different, a different car companies. And so you can't really keep them there to make a deal. It's hard. Um, and then, you know, to make any money, uh, even a little bit of money, you know, they, they grind you down to a point where they don't even believe you're telling the truth. You know, I, I, we would sell, I remember the time I'd sell like a brand new Tahoe for like $40,000. And it's weird the way the business works. I mean, it may be different than it's been a while, but, you know, sometimes the, the car dealership, buys these brand new cars on invoice and they don't have them that much money over invoice. You know, they'll have a $40,000 car and maybe they have a thousand dollars over invoice. So like, you know, these, depending on the car and the company and the programs, all this stuff, right? So you're going like a negotiation and I'm like, listen, I, I really don't have anything else to do. <laughs> and, and, and like, I had points where like my manager would bring out the invoice from like Chevy and say, this is the invoice we bought the car from. Like this, <laughs> here is, here is, you know what I mean? Because it's, so it's hard because um, it, it's it's hard to get people to give you their undivided attention without. I think they're. I think a lot of people come in so combative too that they, you know, uh, they don't want to have a chance to sit down and talk. So I always just tried to, to diffuse that and, and be me and just try and figure out what they wanted. It, it was hard, but I say what if you want to learn about yourself and learn, uh, you know kind of survival skills in terms of making some money. I mean, if you want to eat, you got to sell cars. That's the bottom line. And, uh, you know, I, I learned, you know, I learned how to negotiate. I honestly learned how to ask for things that I wanted. You know, I mean, when I when I went back to FAN and, and you know, I was, when I wanted to work there, when I asked Spitzy, hey, I, I want to work there, I don't think I would have asked him that before, you know? So I think it's just, it was a lesson to just ask for what you want, you know? Um, because if you don't get it, no big deal. But if you don't ask, how are you going to get it? I mean, it's when I asked my agent about doing football, like that's, like, you know, I don't know that I would have asked that, but I just said, hey, this is what I need and want to do, you know, and if he doesn't get me a job, he doesn't get me a job. So it was, it was good. Now, Eddie Scazzeri, he ran in here when I was starting this. He's not here now. He ran in, he dropped me a note and he ran off. And I swear, okay. I have no idea what this means, Okay. but he said, ask him what the name Genghis Khan means. <laughs> well, you know, there was, I, I, I'm trying to think, I, I, I'd be embarrassed to say that I don't remember the genesis of it. Right. But when, when I was at, um, and Eddie, I know I have to call Eddie because i got to remember how it started. But when I was at the, the fan initially, there was this, there was this cockamamie thing where I was still, when I started initially, I was, I was just part-time updates instead of the fan. Okay. And I was still at WCBS. 
before uh, Eric brought me over to kind of be full time there. So CBS, for some ungodly reason, had the, you know, didn't want me to use my real name as a fan. I have no idea why. So I would go on the fan and, and do updates as Kevin Wayne. Okay. So that turned into a that turned into a hilarious thing because everybody everybody knew the deal and I get you know they you know, they crushed me every time I was in there. Kevin Wayne is here and all you know all this stuff. And then gosh, I gotta ask Eddie now, but somehow spin off of that some uh, something happened and my name to 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 Eddie became Genghis. So he would call me, uh, you know, to work. So he would call me and, and the phone would ring and be like, "Hello, Genghis, Gazeri." <laughs> um, I have a shift on Thursday and a talk shift Saturday morning. You in? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Genghis. And, and that would be the conversation. So he, <laughs> Scazzeri is the best, man. He Please tell him hello for me. It is amazing to me the number of people that have prominent jobs in broadcasting now who have come through FAN and specifically somehow through Eddie Scazzeri. It, it, it is incredible. It is incredible. It, there is something about that place, as you know. There's just um, there's just a bond there when you go through it with people, and, and like you know, even people that maybe you never directly work with, you just there's just kind of like a bond that you know you're 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 FAN people, and I don't know, it's it's pretty cool actually. I think. Yes, it is, Kevin. I want to thank you for coming on to the podcast. I've been wanting to talk to you for a while now. I was very against the phone, but I think it worked out great. I'm glad we didn't have any dropout. Uh, in the call. I would have felt terrible about that. No, Al, I enjoyed it, man. Thanks for having me on. It was really cool. And we will catch you uh, next season on the NFL on Fox. You doing baseball stuff also this year with uh, Fox? Yeah, yeah, I'll do mostly studio for baseball. So we have a show called The Whip Around uh, that's on during the week, and then I'll do pre and post for games of the week and and all-star game and stuff like that. So I'll I'll be in the studio more, more often than not. And do you still peek in on uh, SNY Mets uh, games when you can? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I probably watched. I mean, I probably watched about forty-ish Mets games last year. I watched a good amount of them last year. Yeah, I mean, come on, it's still, still my roots. How can I? How can I not? Right. And Keith Hernandez uh, today, as we tape this, just uh, signed a three-year extension with SNY. Oh, you got to keep Keith. I mean, you can't you, you can't break up the uh, the trio. I mean, they're too good. Eric Keith and Ron are too good. You just can't you can't mess that up. You got to keep those guys. My favorite part of those broadcasts is when Keith is contemplating when he can leave and what the traffic situation is going to be. Because all I do is think about traffic myself. So I I could really relate to him. It's getting late. What's traffic going to be like? How am I getting out of here? I got to tell you, I'll leave you with this real quick on Keith. Um, he, he is who he is on the air. He's a great guy. He's uber smart. He's funny. And uh, and that's what makes him great. But I will tell you this about him. And this meant the world to me when I started. You know, I told you earlier in this podcast, and we had that dinner, and I was out with Keith, Ron, and Gary, and, and it was really cool. But So the next day, we have our first spring training broadcast. First time I'm, I'm like on SNY as a Mets guy, you know. Mm-hmm. And... Um, you know, I, I, it was, I was excited. I was nervous and it was fine. It was probably a disaster looking back at it, but I got through it in one piece. Um, and after the game, and you know, just like you said, Keith is always the first to bolt out of there to get, to get home. <laughs> he comes down to the clubhouse, singles me out and says, Hey, and shakes my hand. He's like, I just want to let you know, he's like, you are going to be really, really good at this. He's like, I could already tell. He's like, it's awesome to have you. And I was like, wow. Like, it kind of blew me away because we just had the dinner like the night before. And like for him to do that and say that he did not have to do that. And it just meant a lot at the time. That's what kind of guy Keith Hernandez is. Yeah. And you got to work uh, with two of my favorite players of all time. When I was a kid, Danny white was my guy. I was a, a cowboy fan. He was my, he was the quarterback during my uh, childhood era. Yeah. And as an adult, uh, I covered the Buccaneers during the whole John Lynch era and uh, I, I worked down in Tampa for that. And and that guy was my, as an adult, he's my favorite professional um, sports person. Just because he was a quiet guy, but so intense on the field. And early on covering those uh, Buccaneers teams, you know, they had Warren Sapp, Derek Brooks. They had louder guys. But Lynch was always around the ball. And everyone would always say, who is that? Who's 47? That guy's like, he was always in on the action. 
Yeah, he, he was. And, and you know then the reputation and the kind of guy that he was being down there and the kind of man that he is. Uh, he's just – he's a, he's the ultimate teammate. And, and I'll tell you what, this isn't just from being biased because obviously I really like him and really respect him. But he needs to be voted into the Hall of Fame this yes. time. He's a, he's a finalist again. And I know it's easy for people to look at numbers and say, well, his interceptions and his sacks don't maybe equate to some of the other guys. But anybody who watched football during that era – knows the impact that he had. So, uh, you know, I'm with you now. Yes, and try to get him on Twitter. He's not on Twitter. I don't think that is ever going to happen. That's not happening. You know. (laughs) All right, Kevin. Well, we will check you out this season, baseball and football on Fox and on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle these days? Uh, It's just at Kevin Burkhart. Nice and easy. Thank you very much, Kevin. We will see you down the road. Thanks, Al. Okay, see ya.